Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, it's me Yenny and on this week's Mental Health Monday, I wanted to cover the topic of bipolar disorder. It was highly requested by a lot of you guys who were watching my videos and it's also a disorder that I was very curious about so I was really glad to have put in the time to do some research so that I can share with you guys today. But as with all of my Mental Health Mondays, we have to start with my disclaimer. While I am a mental health professional, these videos are solely for educational purposes. They're not meant to self-diagnose or to diagnose other people. They're not to be used in place of individualized face-to-face -face mental health therapy with a licensed professional. If you are in need of mental health services, please contact a professional. And if you are in a mental health crisis or emergency, please call 911. Now let's get started with this week's video. So today's topic is bipolar disorder. And as with all of my Mental Health Mondays, I always want to start off with the DSM-5. As I stated in my previous video, the DSM-5 is the American Psychiatric Association's their version of the Bible, essentially, of all of the existing mental illnesses and diagnoses. So this is the criteria, all of the check boxes, essentially, that need to be checked off for a mental health professional or a doctor to diagnose someone with a certain mental health condition. Now for me, while the DSM-5 is very, very important and essential, and I even use it in my work, I like to employ more of a biopsychosocial perspective that's taught in the social work field where I realize that an individual is not only his or her psychiatric diagnosis, I like to approach it from more of a, like maybe there's genetics involved, social environment involved, life events involved, and what could lead to a potential diagnosis. So while I start with the DSM-5, I am going to continue on my video with my own research in which all of the statistics and facts and definitions I mention are from published literary articles by other psychologists and psychiatrists and professionals in the field. So if you would like to read them for yourself and to see where I get all my information from, as always, every week, all of my resources are linked down below in the description for further reading if you have more questions. So now, the bipolar and related disorders section of the DSM-5 is pretty long, so I'm not going to sit here and read every little line for you because that's not what I'm here for. So I will also leave these pages down below so you can read them for yourself to try to simplify something that's really not that simple. Essentially, the DSM-5 states that in order to be diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder, it's necessary to meet the following criteria for a manic episode. There's four criteria to be fulfilled in order to state in order to say that someone has experienced a manic episode. I'm going to read those to you now. So manic episode A, a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated expansive or irritable mood and abnormally and persistently increased goal-directed activity or energy lasting at least one week and present most of the day, nearly every day, or any duration if hospitalization is necessary. During the period of mood disturbance and increased energy or activity, three or more of the following symptoms, four if the mood is only irritable, are present to a significant degree and represent a noticeable change from usual behavior. So these are the symptoms. One, inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. Two, decreased need for sleep. For example, someone feels rested after only three hours of sleep and that's usually not their sleep cycle. Number three, more talkative than usual or pressure to keep talking. Number four, flight of ideas or subjective experience that thoughts are racing. Number five, distractibility. Number six, increase in goal-directed activity, either socially, at work, or school, or sexually, or psychomotor agitation. Psychomotor is your body, how you're physically moving, so kind of like shaking or tapping, something like that. Uh, number seven, excessive involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences. For example, engaging in unrestrained buying sprees, sexual indiscretions, or extreme business investments. The mood disturbance is sufficiently severe to cause market impairment in social or occupational functioning or to necessitate hospitalization to prevent harm to self or others or there are psychotic features. And D, the episode is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance, for example, a drug of abuse, a medication, other treatment, or to another medical condition. 
The criteria is that I just read to you A, B, C, D constitute a manic episode and in order to be diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder you must fulfill these four criteria of a manic disorder. So the DSM states that hypomanic episodes or depressive episodes are also very common with those who are potentially diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder but they don't need to be present for you to be diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder. I think what's important to emphasize at this point of the video is that bipolar disorder is a spectrum just like how antisocial personality disorder was when I stated that in my video last week. Bipolar disorder is not just bipolar 1, you have it or you don't have it. Bipolar 2, you have it or you don't have it. So I just threw a bunch of words at you. Manic episodes, hypomanic episodes, depressive episodes. What do these mean? So basically, mania, it's a set of mood symptoms that last at least a week. There's a lot of euphoria and irritability. Hypomania, while the hypo may make it seem like it's an extreme form of mania, it's actually a less severe form of mania. So a hypomanic episode is less severe than a manic episode. When an individual is showing symptoms of hypomania and it is not treated, it can lead to full-blown symptoms of a manic episode. Depressive episodes are episodes in a person's life that show symptoms of the major depressive disorder, which could include symptoms like low energy, low motivation, a loss of interest in daily functioning. So if you could put a simple definition, which is very difficult to do, so bipolar disorder it's essentially a cyclical mood disorder involving periods of like profound disruption to a person's mood and behavior and it's kind of mixed in and interspersed with periods of recovery. To kind of simplify and understand the difference between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 is that bipolar 1, the patient or the person suffers full-blown manic episodes, most commonly interspersed with some depressive episodes as well. And with the bipolar 2 disorder, an individual shows more symptoms of a depressive episodes as a to manic episodes. Another version of bipolar disorder is cyclothymia. With cyclothymia, patients have recurrent hypomanic episodes and subclinical episodes of depression. So subclinical as in the depression is not considered severe enough to be diagnosed to say this person is having depressive episodes, but the mood disturbance is a continuing difficulty and struggle for the individual. There's also softer forms of bipolar disorder where there's not really like a label or a word for it. There's literally a section in the DSM-5 that says unspecified bipolar disorders because it's so hard to really just put into boxes each and every individual's experience with bipolar disorder. Some research has shown that there's individuals that show depressive episodes and also hyperthymic temperament. And hyperthymia is essentially someone who shows extreme moods of like energy, like high energy, positivity. And there's also individuals who experience recurrent depression with antidepressant induced mania. There's a variety of symptoms for bipolar disorder, but interestingly, studies have shown that although mania and hypomania are the defining characteristics of bipolar disorder, throughout the course of the illness, it has shown that depressive episodes are actually a lot more common. In 2002, there was a prospective longitudinal study done on 146 patients who were diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder. So this experiment was done for 12 years where it was reported that depressive symptoms were three times more common for most of the patients who are diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder. A lot of them expressed depressed mood, profound loss in interest in activities, symptoms like fatigue, weight loss or gain, difficulty sleeping or even staying awake, psychomotor slowing down, feelings of worthlessness, um, excessive guilt, suicidal thoughts or actions. Also, it's important to note that when someone is experiencing mania or a manic episode, their insight is lost. So essentially, they are unaware of their actions or that their behaviors may be abnormal. So they do not really consider the need for therapy or treatment of any kind. So it was pretty common throughout the years that psychologists and psychiatrists were thinking that bipolar disorder is strictly genetic. However, there has been more and more evidence throughout the years that self-help and self-management and other forms of treatment have shown benefits in helping and treating those with bipolar disorder. Certain interventions that have shown to be positive include implementing lifestyle changes, managing stress and sleep patterns, and even identifying triggers for what could trigger a manic or depressive or hypomanic episode. For example, a history of child or adolescent abuse, whether it's physical or sexual, has been shown to be related to a range of different adverse outcomes, increase in
and physical and mental health problems, substance misuse, more suicidal attempts, or even more frequent cycling through the bipolar disorder. As therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists, when it comes to treatment of those with bipolar disorder, life stress is something that is very much emphasized in a way that could help treat those with bipolar disorder, but that's really difficult to really quantify a life stress. One thing could be very stressful for one person with bipolar disorder, for, but for another person, it could have no effects whatsoever. So because there's no way to quantify like a subjective concept such as life stress, that could also lead to difficulty in treatment because each person's form of bipolar disorder is so personal to them. So basically, much of research on treatment of bipolar disorder has shown that pharmacological treatments are kind of like on the front runner of treatment for bipolar disorder. For example, um, I'm just reading off this list here because I'm not a psychiatrist. Lithium anticonvulsants, atypical antipsychotics, etc. A form of therapy that I found really interesting that has also shown really positive results in the treatment of bipolar disorder is called the Interpersonal Social Rhythm Therapy. It's IPSRT and it's shown empirical support in reducing the severity and frequency of recurrent episodes of bipolar disorder. So when it comes to this type of therapy, it's multifaceted where psychotherapists and psychopharmacologists work together with the patient. It's kind of like a team effort to not only treat the illness of bipolar disorder with the medication like lithium or antidepressants or whatnot, but also addressing the other parts of their lives which could lead to exacerbating or worsening um, the symptoms and episodes of bipolar disorder. So this team, they take part in kind of in becoming more mindful of how the bipolar disorder has disrupted this person's regular life. So for example, if they're not sleeping normally, of uh, whatever their normal sleep pattern was before, the psychopharmacologist will um, will prescribe whatever medication is deemed necessary for this patient and then the therapist or the psychotherapist will work with the patient on kind of finding that balance and stability in that person's sleep cycle. So essentially they all work together to work on the medication part, on stabilizing daily routines, um, dealing with interpersonal relationships and how that can change and alter with someone who has bipolar disorder. So much of treatment of effective treatment with bipolar disorder seems to be treatment that involves the patient in his or her own treatment where it's a lot of psychoeducation. You don't just say you have this disorder, take this medication, that's it. It's more like kind of letting them know what is to come. And interestingly actually studies have shown that this therapeutic alliance, the more that someone who has bipolar disorder or any mental illness really trusts and has some sort of like alliance with a doctor or their therapist, the better their outcomes of treatment because they trust the person because they're treated as a person, not as just a diagnosis or with just negative stereotypes. Um, and last but not least, to close off my video on bipolar disorder, I wanted to talk about stigma and bipolar disorder. There's a lot of negative stigma that comes with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, even without a diagnosis. I always like to say that language is very, very important. How we use our words is very crucial in society and how we interact with one another. So in the past, or even now really, sometimes you might hear on the street, oh, she's so bipolar like, oh my god, like I'm so bipolar, to kind of try to describe when someone is like this or that or like wishy-washy. We see this a lot with anxiety and depression, which I will go to into more in those specific videos, but it's very easy for people who don't understand what it's like to have the specific disorder to kind of be like, oh, it's a mood disorder. Oh yeah, I have highs and lows. It's no big deal. Just, you'll get over it. I think a lot of that comes from a lack of understanding and kind of misrepresentation of bipolar disorder maybe in the media or just really a lack of awareness of how much this disorder impacts individuals who live with it every day who you know they struggle with it but they thrive despite of it so hearing those things can be pretty difficult I feel like I lack the personal really testimony of how much stigma impacts me as a person since I don't have the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. However, I did link an article from the National Alliance on Mental Illness or NAMI. The specific link that I'll be linking down below is a personal story from someone who has bipolar disorder and her take on stigma and what it's like to deal with stigma as someone who has bipolar disorder. So that is linked down below. I highly suggest you read up on it. I just hope that by understanding more about this topic and about the personal stories of those who have bipolar disorder who may be experiencing 
symptoms of bipolar disorder, we will be able to spread awareness and contribute in the getting rid of negative stigma when it comes to mental illnesses. Thank you so, so much for watching this week's Mental Health Monday. I truly appreciate you being here. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I make mental health videos every Monday and free fall Fridays, I upload whatever I feel like uploading that week, I guess. I hope you have an absolutely lovely day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye! Thank you.